佩洛西的所作所为是对中国主权和领土完整的挑衅和侵犯。Taiwan finds itself in the middle of the United States and China's tussle for geopolitical dominance. The mainland has declared its willingness to annex the island by force, against a backdrop of heightened geopolitical tension. How are the Taiwanese people responding to being caught between giants? We will not accept any kind of invasion encroaching our sovereignty. I just hope uh, that uh, it's really clear that while China has stood in the way of Taiwan participating and going to certain meetings, that they understand that they will not stand in the way of people coming to Taiwan. It's a show of friendship, of support, but also a source of learning about how we can work together better in collaboration. On August 3rd, 2022, Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, landed in Taiwan. A disregard of China's objections. Pelosi, ignoring China's warning and repeated instructions, only visited Taiwan, seriously damaging the foundation of China's political system. Speaker Pelosi is the highest-ranking U.S. official to step foot on the island in a quarter of a century. Visits from other high-ranking U.S. officials followed. To China, these diplomatic calls advocate for Taiwanese independence. Beijing views this as a violation of the One China Principle, which regards Taiwan as part of China. China she is uh, a very important politician in the United States, of course, um, and her visit would have very important meaning to Taiwan um, as well as the whole region uh, in the Pacific. Chen Kuanting leads over nine analysts at Taiwan Next Gen Foundations, founded in 2016. It is a think tank focused on domestic policy and international affairs. I don't think Speaker Pelosi is trying to provoke anyone. If she chooses to come to Taiwan, it's a very friendly action to us. Why does it have to be provocation to China? I don't think that's related. Uh, but of course, China would think differently. I don't think China's um, concept on escalating everything would be uh, helpful for, that, for their national interest because there will be a lot of officials visiting Taiwan and if they react like what they are doing right now, there will be no place for uh, negotiation uh, between the United States and China. Speaker Pelosi's visit comes at a time of deteriorating ties between the US and China. Sino-U.S. relations turned adversarial under the Trump administration. As we pursue this bright future, we must hold accountable the nation which unleashed this plague onto the world, China. And continued with President Biden. China has an overall goal, and I don't criticize them for the goal, but they have an overall goal to become the leading country in the world the wealthiest country in the world and the most powerful country in the world. That's not going to happen on my watch. At the same time, under President Xi Jinping, China had become more assertive, both militarily and diplomatically. 
the resources they use on their military expenditure is also increasing um, and has been increasing for the past 27 years. Things are different, especially after you know, the second half uh, of uh, Xi's administrations. China is dealing with the war in a very different way. Before that, they are focusing on business partnership between uh, China and other foreign um, you know, sovereignties. Um, so economy first and other thing next. Right now it's wolf warrior diplomacy. Named after a Chinese action blockbuster, wolf warrior diplomacy refers to a more assertive and aggressive form of foreign policy. As the two superpowers vie for dominance, the status of Taiwan has become a political and ideological battleground. Xi Jinping主席同拜登总统通电话时强调，中国政府和中国人民在台湾问题上的立场是一以贯之的，坚决维护中国国家主权和领土完整，是十四亿多中国人民的坚定意志，民意不可违，玩火必自焚。中美应
from a neighboring country that is powerful and that is an authoritarian regime. Members of Taiwan's ruling party agree. Vincent Chow is the former director of the political division of Taiwan's Democratic Progressive Party. He was also the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative in the United States. I think Ukraine has two things. First of all, really highlighted how precarious democracies all over the world are. Um, and so this conflict has really highlighted um, Taiwan and Ukraine and other democracies standing on the front lines in terms of maintaining our way of life and our freedoms. We see common values in maintaining the integrity of democracy, whether it's here in Taiwan or anywhere in the world. Thus, recent events have woken the Taiwanese up to the possibility that an attack by China may now be a question of when, rather than an if. Military veteran Max Chiang runs Polar Light Training, a tactical training range for civilians in Taipei. Here, ordinary people can learn combat skills such as moving in tactical formation and firing weapons. He has seen an uptick in enrollment since the war in Ukraine. 大概是兩到四倍之間的成長,所以來的人數很多。This reflects a growing sense of insecurity following the war in Ukraine. At the outset of the war, poll results published by the Taiwanese Public Opinion Foundation showed that about 26% of respondents thought an attack by China to be likely. Six months on, this number grew to around 39%. 战争的形式其实一样是一强一落的问题啦，就是说，哦，我们看到就是俄罗斯是军力排行第二名的国家，相对于乌克兰，但就如同我们之于中国，对，所以这个我觉得相似之处通常是在这里。Now Russia has already invaded Ukraine, and now Taiwan, no matter what level, government level or civilian level, we have to learn from their lesson, from their experience, and we can prepare ourselves when China. One day really invade Taiwan. And against this backdrop, the Taiwanese people's reception to Speaker Pelosi's trip was mixed. The people on the ground, the ordinary citizens, uh, were excited about her visit. And just uh, search the internet, uh, look at the, how many young people taking their cell phones and try to film. Uh, her airplane's uh, incoming path and landing. That's one part. Another part of the Taiwan ordinary citizens is that they do not want trouble. They do not want tension or military threat, coercion, uh, that make life difficult. So this is a time for ordinary citizens to think and to reflect and see whether this is uh, a price that we will pay every time when a senior dignitary visited Taiwan. For many Taiwanese people, they understand that the U.S. and China want to seek their own interests. So more and more Taiwanese people have to choose a side. Yeah, so many Taiwanese people, indeed, they feel that they are being caught between this U.S. and uh, U.S.-China competition. As Taiwan faces its geopolitical reality, of being caught between two giants. How will its people react? The Ukraine war has Taiwan's government and people nervous and some have galvanized around preparing for an invasion. Max Chow of Polar Light Training has seen participation rates for his tactical courses climb. When you 
所以我觉得大家一开始来参与这样的课程，可能都是这个立场。从二月底开始到现在，大概不同的课程有不同的差别，大概是两到四倍之间的成长。Miles away, at another tactical training range in Taiwan, 40-year-old military veteran Chris Chen keeps his skills honed. 大家都会有这个心理因素跟跟认知，说，哎，我今天要先保卫自己，才有机会得到其他人的的帮助。这样，就像乌克兰，他是因为自己的自己人。挺身而出保卫自己国家，其他国家才会愿意帮助他。上台，上台。Chris Chen served in Taiwan's military for a decade as a captain, and is one of many Taiwanese who no longer believe that they can depend on the U.S. for aid. 我是持保留态度啦，当然就是先自己要先坚持住，才有机会，才有机会得到其他人的资源嘛，对啊，因为你不可能时时刻刻都想要有人把鱼丢给你啊，你要自己想办法去钓鱼啊。Results published in March 2022 by the Taiwanese Public Opinion Foundation showed that around 56% of respondents share Chris's sentiments. They think the U.S. is unlikely to send troops in defense of Taiwan. Look, the idea, the idea that we're going to send in offensive equipment and have planes and tanks and trains going in with American pilots and American crews, just understand, and don't kid yourself, no matter what you all say, that's called World War III. Today, to the scene, 大家的共同意识要够强。如果说真的中共打过来，我是不轻易投降的那一种。However, without intervention from the Americans, any conflict between China and Taiwan is likely to be one-sided. The Chinese People's Liberation Army is two million strong, outnumbering the Taiwanese military. Ten to one. 我是觉得不足啦，对，因为依步兵制的政策来讲，就大家只要当四个月。Mandatory conscription was introduced in Taiwan in 1951, with a two-year term of service for most males above 18. But since 2003, the term of military service was gradually reduced. With a name change to a volunteer system rather than conscription. We are now actively pushing the military. We need high-quality military officers. How can we get the high-quality military systems very efficiently? Military training was reduced to appease younger voters. But some feel that the shortened training period is inadequate, seeking out additional training at tactical centers like Polar Light. Four months can be in the field to get the training that was more short than before. So their skills and knowledge may not be able to be applied. At these tactical training schools, Trainees learn everything from basic first aid to how to handle and fire weapons safely while moving. As cross-strait relations grow tense, there are calls for a return to longer military conscription. There are discussions on extend four months uh, military service to 12 months, so that um, our soldiers could be more prepared on you know, uh, the worst scenarios. Um, they will be more capable of uh, operating uh, sophisticated equipments. But this is debatable um, because you know, any in change of policy would uh, take time and efforts. It will need the parliament to pass. 
Politically, this could be a hard sell to young voters who see extended military service as a disruption to their lives. Now they notice that it still depends on the competition between the China and the United States. They believe that they will stuck to the status quo forever. This is, it is not something that they can change on their own. So it also influences their attitude on the, the independence and unification. Any military conflict between China and Taiwan would depend on the island's push for independence, or what is widely regarded as the proverbial red line. But within Taiwan, the calls for independence have grown louder, especially among the youth. Traditionally speaking, the um, younger generations are more pro-independence uh, and their Taiwanese identity is stronger. So um, according to Commonwealth survey, actually 49.4% or close to 50% of the uh, generation from 20 to 29 uh, responded that they would uh, like to uh, pursue independence of Taiwan. There's a fundamental differences between Taiwanese government and the Chinese government and the CCP, the authoritarian regime. We have our own identity. We are never governed by the PRC. I don't think the independent is, is a problem. When I go overseas, I, I show my passport, they will say, oh, you are from Taiwan. They will say, oh, you are from China. No, they, they don't say that. Like the Ukraine war, an event elsewhere has colored how the Taiwanese view Chinese relations. The 2019 Hong Kong protests. Following widespread calls for independence in Hong Kong, Beijing enacted the national security law, restricting civil liberties and arresting dissidents. People in Taiwan are being affected by how the CCP treated the people in Hong Kong uh, on the way they deal with the protests. So I think that the Hong Kong factor plays an important role among many Taiwanese people, especially among the younger generation, that they don't really trust the promise offered by the Chinese government. Actually, the many Taiwanese people, the younger generation, they are still willing to fight. When we ask many young people that well, are you going to fight against China once China invaded Taiwan? Many Taiwanese people will say yes, but they will insist that the reason they want to fight is not because they want independence or not because they love the DPP, but the reason they want to fight is that they want to maintain their way of life. They notice the different way of life between the younger generations in China and in Taiwan. For example, more than 80% of the younger generations in Taiwan support the same-sex marriage. Yeah, so the reason to fight is not for independence or for Tsai ing but it's for their way of life. But not everyone wants a divorce from China. Who are the Taiwanese who prefer maintaining the status quo or even reunification with the mainland? There are a group of uh, older generation in Taiwan who identify themselves as Chinese, who love the Chinese culture. They want to seek reunification with China as soon as possible. Taiwanese attitudes towards the island's political future vary. Majority prefer independence or to maintain the status quo, while about 10% are unsure. But there is a slice of the 23 million strong population, about a tenth, that lean towards reunification. There is a group of uh, older generation in Taiwan, they, they want unification as soon as possible. But the reason is they believe in the Chinese culture. But now the element of the Chinese culture is gradually declining in Taiwan. So they want to seek reunification with China as soon as possible. They want to bring the Chinese culture and the, the, the pro-Chinese nationalism back to Taiwan. 
Despite the tensions from US-China rivalry and rising support for independence, the island is dependent on China, at least economically. China is Taiwan's largest trading partner, accounting for more than 40% of its exports. Pre-COVID, Taiwan exports to China was nearly $250 billion. Beijing can inflict pain targeted at Taiwan without using military force. They could um, cut off uh, or sweep away our trade agreement across the Taiwan Strait. Um, they could uh, uh, impose uh, more hardship uh, conditions on almost a million Taiwan's investors and managers now living on the mainland. But again, Taiwan and, and the mainland uh, are not necessarily in the game uh, that one man's success, one side's success is definitely the other side's lose. Uh, because we do have uh, uh, a high level of interdependency economically uh, in terms of trade and also in terms of human relationship. But the economic relationship has hit a snag. China's zero COVID policy and closed borders isolated the Middle Kingdom from the world. As businesses, shops and restaurants shut to prevent the spread of the virus, Chinese demand for imports fell sharply. Jingwa,东太清零的防控措施会对部分地区的生产生活带来一些影响,但这些影响是短期的,范围是有限的,应该说,任何防控措施都会要有一定的代价,但同保护人民生命安全和身体健康相比,这些代价都是值得的。As borders shut, trade with Taiwan stalled, and so did revenues of many Taiwanese businesses that depend on the Chinese market, including fish farmers. China plays curbs on import of Taiwanese produce, including live fish. Oh, 那國內的實體通路的話,不多,不多,對。國人對老闆十班這一塊的就是可能他價位會比較高一點,所以沒有到很普遍。潘 runs a grouper farm outside of Taipei City. Around 9 out of 10 groupers farmed in Taiwan were sold to the mainland. Ho 沒有,你不可能說,誒,拍攝疫情哦,你想賣價,沒有,你不可能說,誒,拍攝疫情哦,你想賣價,沒有,你不可能說,誒,拍攝疫情哦,你想賣價,沒有,你不可能說,誒,
Uh, and we don't see a valid basis for this. COVID, I think, is one excuse and one justification that PRC has been using in terms of their economic intimidation. China basically stated that they welcome uh, Taiwanese farmers' products. And if we somehow comply with their instructions, and sometimes they might give uh, some implication that, hey, you need to do this in order to get more uh, market opened. And they were, they were trying to use this as a method to uh, change our voters' uh, intention. So I think among those people who are doing business with China, they prefer to maintain the status quo as much as possible because it can reduce the uncertainty. But Beijing's strategy of economic pressure could backfire. Exports to the United States almost doubled between 2016 and 2021, growing by 97%. It was also announced that the U.S. and Taiwan will start formal talks on a trade and economic initiative in late 2022. As China leaves Taiwan out in the economic cold, the island is reducing its reliance on the Chinese market. While China tried to weaponize the trade and try to manipulate the market uh, by their policies, but you can see that the, the, the world is still based on the free market idea that the capital can flow to different places. Economic security is something that we as a country need to take seriously. And so when you have um, such a large amount of trade going to the PRC, that gives an undue amount of leverage. And so this is why I think Taiwan has made it a matter of priority. Uh, in terms of building trade relationships with the U.S. and other democracies. There is one more way that China's COVID policies have affected Taiwanese sentiments. They don't want to be locked up like people in Shanghai. They want to go to, they want to have an opportunity to talk to their physicians, their uh, medical doctors, uh, on how to deal with the, the problems, uh, the, their public health issues. But it, what happened in Shanghai, it appears not just a rejection to democracies. These are factors that push older generation, younger generation, old generations away. As Taiwanese attitudes towards China and the U.S. shift, how will Taiwanese politicians adjust their stance on cross-straits relations? Our responsibility is to maintain peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. In two months, Taiwan will be holding its local elections. This is my election manifesto, and I think it's important to have policies as, as a candidate, regardless if you're running for Taipei City Council, for legislator, or even for head of state. Candidates of the upcoming local elections are just starting to campaign. So this is a bobblehead one of my supporters made me, and I found this bobblehead quite interesting. Uh, because uh, this supporter put uh, the U.S. shield but with the DPP logo and that's supposed to symbolize kind of the close relationship we have with the United States and my perceived role in it. So I, I found this uh, to be quite a good batch of bobbleheads to hand out uh, during the course of my campaign because I think it really shows what we're trying to do here in Taipei which is how do we create a more globalized, how to create a more international city uh, whereas where we can connect with other democracies around the world. While their messages for the upcoming 2022 local elections are focused on domestic policy and improving the lives of Taiwan's citizens, recent geopolitical events have voters primed to consider a broader rhetoric. If it's local elections, usually we do not uh, put them much attention on diplomacies or cultural relations. But again, things are changing these days. Taiwan has become top news on the war arena, so um, 
the diplomatic uh, achievements of the central government of Chinese administration might have positive effects to the local elections. The two main parties in Taiwanese politics are the current ruling Democratic Progressive Party, led by current President Tsai Ing-wen, and the main opposition party, the Kuomintang. Between the two, the DPP is seen as the party that leans more towards independence. DPP's position uh, on the cross trade issues and also our foreign policies is that the, uh, we will insist to uh, maintain our uh, liberal and democratic institution, constitution. We will not accept any kind of invasion and uh, encroaching our uh, sovereignty. Taiwan and China, two countries not subordinated to each other, which also outlines the status quo right now. And Taiwan's future has to be uh, decided by uh, uh, 23 million Taiwanese people. On the other side of the aisle, the Kuomintang, or KMT, also known as the Chinese Nationalist Party, is perceived by many to be more China-friendly. Alexander Huang is the representative to the U.S. for the KMT. For KMT, we want to promote our visibility. We want to work with all liberal democracies. Um, but the difference is that we wanted to maintain a constructive, ambiguous, but a manageable and workable communication line with the other side to make sure that we can reduce tension before and we can manage a crisis after. Uh, that's our niche. It's not our liability. But some experts disagree. As popular sentiment in Taiwan turns against China, KMT's perceived coziness with the mainland has affected their political fortunes. It lost the 2020 presidential elections by a 20-point margin. The KMT or the Nationalist Party uh, is struggling for the past two uh, elections. Some people think it's because of their policy uh, on China. Um, people think they are too pro-China, they are working too close to the Chinese Communist Party. Um, traditionally, people in Taiwan are being more uh, friendly to the United States. They were inclined to vote for uh, politicians. They are you know, being closer to uh, the United States or to the very uh, fundamental values of you know, democracy and human rights. At the same time, Taiwan. President Tsai remains popular. The approval rating of President Tsai in her second term. In the past of Taiwan's history, that uh, no any president can achieve that. Over 50% of approval rating, and even the cabinet as well. Perhaps in a bid to boost the KMT's popularity, the current chairman, Eric Chu, emphasized the party's allegiance during a recent trip to Washington. The question then is whether the results at the local elections will push both parties towards the U.S. as they lean into populism. This could impact the next Taiwanese presidential elections slated for 2024. I think it's going to be a political bellwether for how um, the DPP and the KMT does going forward. For the 2024 election, the presidential elections, I would say uh, diplomacy play a very important role. So. Maybe it's a way to reject China. It's a way to approve um, our way of living, our values, our core values uh, for the 2024 elections. Yet others caution against using the ballot box to register anti-Chinese sentiments. We have to uh, also understand that your ballot comes with responsibility. It's not a cheaper way to express your anger or anxiety. If we consider that voting uh, a party that China hates the most is a cheap way to express our anger, then 
we probably get it wrong. Uh, we need to be very rational to think about that this vote will determine our future. Our responsibility is to maintain peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. And across the strait, China is faced with an upcoming election of its own. As the Chinese Communist Party convenes its Congress in October, all signs point to Xi Jinping being picked for an unprecedented third term. This could alter China's stance on Taiwan. Xi Jinping always promote his agenda of the great rejuvenation of China, and part of his of this narrative is that. Taiwan must be reunified with China. So in the eye of, of the Chinese government, they will not let the status quo to be maintained forever. The space for maintaining the status quo on the Taiwan Strait becomes smaller and smaller. If she continue being in power, definitely would uh, add up a lot of uncertainties. And that is something um, we need to work on with our partners in the United States. Uh, like politicians, diplomats, or uh, military leaders. So when we are facing this imminent threat, we will be ready. At the same time, the U.S. is gearing up for its own elections. The United States will hold its midterms in November 2022, where all 435 seats in the House of Representatives and 35 of the 100 seats in the Senate will be contested. Some candidates from both Democrat and Republican parties are likely to take a strong stance against China to project American strength. The real threats we face should remind all of us about the importance of leading by example and putting America first. That starts with taking the threat of China seriously. Depending on how this message resonates with voters, this hardline stance on China could carry into 2024 when America decides its next president. I believe the politicians and leaders in the United States, uh, their stance to Taiwan or to this Indo-Pacific region, uh, this is bipartisan. It doesn't matter a Republican president, uh, take control or a uh, democratic president take control, they probably will make similar decisions on Taiwan's issues. So I'm not that concerned on who will be the next president of the United States. I'm more concerned on, you know, institution cooperations between Taiwan and the United States to prevent the worst scenario, the worst scenario from happening. There is an African proverb, when elephants fight, the grass gets trampled. Taiwan's leaders walk a tight rope between courting larger democracies who will come to its aid when threatened, while maintaining an amenable relationship with the mainland. In the end, the fate of Taiwan may not be decided by its people. Uh, good to see you, Mr. President. Instead, it rests on how the superpower rivalry between China and the U.S. plays out. If we ask Taiwanese people, well, if China will not attack Taiwan one day in the future, do you support independence or not? And in such an imag imagined scenario, then the majority of Taiwanese people would say yes. But if we put the condition back to the reality, we ask if China will attack Taiwan, do you still seek independence? Then most of the Taiwanese people will say no, we just want a status quo. The recent uh, competition between the US and China will make the space for maintaining the status quo become narrower and narrower. So more and more Taiwanese people now, even though they don't want to, but it seems like they have to choose a side.